decision about which way to go and jump to this control law and come around this way. And so there's an internal variable I use in my controller to break this robustness problem that will be a hybrid controller because it will have a state that makes jumps once in a while about you know, which direction I should go, but otherwise everything's continuous. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why I got into hybrid systems. I wanted to be able to solve these types of problems robustly, and I knew that classical feedback couldn't really do it. Um, but hybrid feedback can. And of course, then you can imagine that all of these things come together where, yes, you have some type of obstacle to avoid. You either need to go to the right or to the left. And the system that's going around it maybe itself is also modeled in some hybrid way with, with impacts. Maybe this is a, a robot that's trying to find its way from, from one side to another while avoiding obstacles. All right, so with that as motivation, the question that we ask is, do we have the tools necessary to analyze and develop feedback control algorithms for these systems? Um, you know, we'd like to not just do this in an ad hoc manner where you know, we've got something in the, in the lab and we want to just kind of in an ad hoc way come up with some solution. We'd like to understand these hybrid systems systematically. Now, hybrid systems have been studied extensively for over two decades. These are all book um, covers that won't mean much to you if you're not in the field, but I just wanted to use it as a roadmap to kind of show you what kind of progress has been made over the years from what's known and kind of some of the gaps as well. So first of all, um, there's a, a conference on hybrid systems that's been going on for over 20 years. It started off uh, with, with humble origins and fairly small, but it's a pretty sizable workshop now, and each year uh, proceedings of that comes out. And in this, this workshop, it's really the, the fundamental nature is to see the interaction of control engineers with computer scientists. And uh, there's been some very fertile interaction between those two groups through this conference. And you can imagine that that would be a natural thing to bring these two groups together for hybrid systems where you've got the interaction of continuous and discrete. On the math side, um, there aren't any great textbooks on hybrid systems. Something that's related and that has been around again for over 20 years are books on impulsive differential equations. Um, so you can imagine that that would be related to hybrid systems. Those are differential equations where at times you allow the state to make an instantaneous change due to some impulsive effect. Now usually in impulsive differential equations, the times at which the impulses occur are kind of pre-programmed. And so there are some differences with, with hybrid systems, but nevertheless they're, they're, they're related. And there's some other things that have appeared in the math literature um, that again are related, but don't exactly get to all of the key issues that come up when you're talking about these things in the context of control. Um, there are a couple of, probably much more than I know about, um, interesting books on non-smooth mechanics, where again, you look at systems with impacts, and you, you understand uh, the behavior of those types of systems from a fairly general point of view. Um, a popular topic in, in the control literature is switching systems, and so several people have written books on switching systems and control, where um, this might be the situation where you've got several different controllers in one plant that you're trying to control, and you think about switching between the different controllers and ask yourself, what's the effect of switching between them going to be on the overall performance of the system? And then there are books that are on hybrid dynamical systems at a, a fairly theoretical level. Um, but one thing that's noteworthy in these books is that um, for reasons that I, I'll try to explain a little bit more clearly in a minute, they don't get at a lot of the main tools that we use for nonlinear control, systems that aren't hybrid, that you would expect and hope to be available for hybrid systems so that you could exploit them in the same way that they're exploited for, for nonlinear control systems. So just to elaborate on that, for my students who work in nonlinear control, um, they, they take a course on nonlinear systems. And I don't know how common a course like that is for you guys. Uh, 
maybe not since you're in a smaller department, but all of my students take a course on nonlinear systems. It's taught every year. I usually teach it out of this book by Hassan Khalil, but there are other competitors as well that pre present similar information. And some of the key things that you find in those books that we rely on in nonlinear control design are things like Lyapunov functions. So for those of you who work with control faculty, you know exactly what Lyapunov functions are. For others of you, you may not. There are ways of, um, without actually solving for the solutions of a differential equation, guaranteeing still that the solutions tend to an equilibrium point or a set that's desirable. So they're really a, a fundamental workhorse for, for nonlinear systems and for nonlinear, certifying that nonlinear control algorithms do the right thing. There are other <clears throat> tools that show up in these books as well that are very important. There's something called the invariance principle which allows you to weaken a little bit the conditions on the Lyapunov function to get the type of behavior that you want. There's a thorough discussion in these books about robustness properties. And I alluded to this in the circle example, where you want to have the property that if there's small perturbations to your system, that doesn't affect the behavior very much. Which wasn't the case for that circle example if we were trying to use a discontinuous algorithm that tried to split going clockwise versus counterclockwise where we could put in arbitrarily small noise and make it so that we never got close to the point that we always converge to without noise. Um, you've probably heard of the linearization principle, which is that if you're just interested in controlling locally about, about an equilibrium point, um, you can transform the nonlinear dynamics into a linear system, taking the linearization, the Jacobian linearization, so based on a Taylor series expansion, and as long as the linearization is controllable, so you can make sense out of control algorithms for it, you can build a control algorithm for the linearization and be sure that it works at least locally for the nonlinear system. Um, there are results in there that say, look, if you design something when the parameters are fixed, then you can be sure that it still works if the parameters vary slowly, um, if you cascade two systems together under fairly weak properties, if they each behave well independently, they're going to behave well when connected together. These are all tools that you can use to figure out whether your control algorithm is going to be successful or not. And there's some other things that show up as well. Um, things that say, like, um, sometimes control <coughs> algorithms are implemented with something called um, pulse width modulation where instead of implementing a continuous feedback, you implement it with a bunch of ones and zeros, where the amount of time that you leave the control at one or zero depends on the actual value of the control that you'd like to implement. And that, in and of itself, is hard to analyze, but it turns out that there's theory that says that as long as you're flipping back and forth between ones and zeros rapidly enough, you can really just focus on the average behavior of, of that actuator, which means you can really just look at the continuous variable you wanted to implement, and as long as that works okay, which it would by design, things are going to work okay for the implementation that just uses ones and zeros. This is something called averaging theory that applies to general differential equations that's very useful to know about when implementing continuous feedback. Um, another thing that people learn in a course like this is singular perturbation theory. This means what happens if you've got a control system and you're, there's an actuator that isn't really instantaneous, there's some very fast dynamics that are involved. Can you ignore those fast dynamics and design a control algorithm that just assumes that your actuator is instantaneous and then say, will it still work now that I recognize that the dynamics are not instantaneous but they're fast? And the theory says yes, as long as the separation of time scales is fast enough, it'll still work. Um, and the thing that I want to point out here is that all of these, or almost all of these tools that we rely on to design nonlinear control algorithms are not tools that have shown up in the hybrid systems literature until recently. And they don't appear in most of those books that I talked about. And that's one of the things that we've been focusing on because we recognize the significance of these tools for nonlinear control and we say, well, is there a way to make them available also for hybrid systems? Before we get there, 
I need to lay out for you what a mathematical model of a hybrid system is in the first place. And as I do this, I want to write down something that looks as much like a differential equation as possible, but of course I recognize that clearly there's some extra things going on. And so I, I need a model that's going to be more complex, but hopefully not more complex than it needs to, to be. So a model of a hybrid dynamical system is, well, I need a model that combines continuous time and discrete time dynamics. So how am I going to do that? Well, so there are a couple of features that I've alluded to as I talked about hybrid systems at the beginning. First of all, these hybrid systems have to combine continuous change and instantaneous change. For example, if I'm thinking about dropping a ball, um, as I hit the floor, I want some, something that captures the fact that the velocity is going to change instantaneously from being negative to being positive. Or if I've got some hysteresis variable that says, at one point it says go clockwise, the other it says go counterclockwise, and there's going to be some region where I change my mind about which way to go, that's going to be an instantaneous change from, say, some integer that represents clockwise to a different integer that represents counterclockwise. So I need a model that allows for both of those. So as a cartoon, you might imagine um, a state variable, maybe an x1, x2 component, that maybe starts right here at this dot, think of that as an initial condition, and changes continuously while it's in this green region, and continues to do so along some direction that would come from a differential equation until it reaches this red zone right here where it's no longer able to continue in the green, but it's in the red, which we think of as a region where jumps can occur, and so a jump happens, and maybe the state jumps over to this new value, and now it's in the green, and it can change continuously again, and so it does so. And it reaches the red, and it makes a jump, and then it's green, and it goes. Traffic light and its colors are not coincidental here. And so you've got a state that's evolving in the plane there that it sometimes flows and it sometimes jumps. That's one thing we want to capture in our model. In addition, we want to capture the fact that our, our system may have variables that are continuously valued and other variables that are discrete valued. So like physical variables in a mechanical system are going to be variables that take on continuous values, like position and velocity. Similarly, if you have some timer in your system where based on what time it is, uh, you'll take one action, but when you reach a deadline, you perform some other action, the timer variable is going to be continuous value. On the other hand, you could immediately, um, easily imagine that interacting with your continuous variables might be variables that take on discrete values, like logic states, on or off, or yes or no, or counter variables that increment by integers. Right? So we want models that allow for continuous change, instantaneous change, and that allow for variables with continuous values and, and with, uh, with discrete values. So, we can do that in a fairly compact way. So we're going to take all the possible states that we could have, whether they're continuous valued or discrete valued, I don't care, and we'll just combine them all together and call that a variable x, and we'll embed it into a Euclidean space which is where our states of a differential equation typically evolve. So everything's compacted into a single variable x. <coughs> Again, x might have logic variables in it, counters, um, positions, velocities, timers, whatever. And in addition then to, the, to specifying the state, we need to specify where continuous change is allowed. And that's going to be specified through the set C, which will be color-coded in green. And then a rule about how continuous change occurs, which would be according to some differential equation. Um, and there's no U here in the sense that this system might be after feedback has been applied already. In addition, we specify where instantaneous change can occur. That would be specified through a set D. That would be color-coded red. And a rule about how instantaneous change occurs. This last line is just saying, given the current value of the state, x, What's the next value of the state, x plus? Well, it's going to be some function of the current state. That's a lot like a difference equation as opposed to